our eyes and our... Okay, good morning. Pankaj Shah, uh, 180 days old in Texas, uh, as uh, Florence mentioned. First of all, thank you everybody, uh, Lisa especially, Marianne, for bringing us here. Uh, although I'm uh, joining as part of Internet 2 team, uh, as, as very much what Florence said, learn is your network. And, uh, you know, Dennis uh, Foudy is on the LEARN board. You're one of the charter members of LEARN. I will take you through some of the, the discussions and some... Uh, okay, slight delay here. Uh, that's the backbone of LEARN and how it looks. Uh, how many of you knew about LEARN before you saw this agenda today? Four or five of you, and I bet you you're connected much closer to IT or doing some research on the network. So I'm glad uh, that you've invited us to, to tell you what happens behind the scenes, really, uh, for things to happen. And it was, uh, it's been a long six or eight weeks at least process where we've had weekly or bi-weekly calls on this from us and our staff just so you know to pick the brains and, and bringing this session together. Uh, as, as you can see, I've had only about 180 days in Texas, but the main attraction for me to, to, to leave Midwest after 20 years and be here is uh, not this 100 degree every day, but, but how I'm going to feel good uh, come September into, into next uh, March so I don't have to shovel snow. But what happens here and why Internet2 and why Learn and why Ornet and other networks, uh, it's this community. It's the research and education community. Uh, many years ago, and we had uh, this discussion last night on the history of these networks and Internet2, that video is incredible, by the way, to get you to some, it may not cover everything, but it has a lot to do with our community. The reason for existence or even for LEARN, LEARN is a nascent network. It's only about 11 years old now. Uh, some of the other networks in the country, like Merit, is almost uh, 50 years. Uh, you have uh, MCNC Ornets, which are 25, 30 years old. Uh, we have Farnet, which used to be 30 years old, and NSFNet. The reason is this community that you see today from students into researchers into, into network administrators and, and all of us has existed throughout. It's that the necessity of having a unique, a fast, a seamless, a friction-free connectivity is the basis why we are here today. So somebody can say, hey, why don't we use, you know, we all have public networks. Each one of this segment has a public network. In fact, the, the, the piece of fiber that we are using is purchased from, uh, from commodity network companies, from our partners in telecommunications. The difference between what they would normally do for us when we go to the Googles and the Microsofts and other places versus what Learn and Internet 2 enables for you is the number of hops and how clean we take that bandwidth from one place to the other. So as I go through flurry of examples of what's going on, each one of those things is possibly, you can do that theoretically on any network, but I bet you, you would be picking up phones to Dennis's office or somebody and say, what is going wrong? Why can't I get this done? And that's the ubiquitousness with which the networks operate, and that's why you have not heard too much about LEARN and Internet2 from the, from the perspective of the infrastructure that's provided to you by such, by such networks. So just a little bit of background as to why we exist, why uh, we work with you, what the difference is, and you will see these experiments as you look at, and you probably know a lot of these, for me, coming in from outside Texas, I'm doing a lot of reading. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit of background, uh, over the last six months, uh, actually Houston was the first place I came in early uh, April with, with our staff and a facilitator, and we've done strategic planning all across the state. 
Uh, and so we, we had four regional meetings, Houston, Dallas, Lubbock, and Austin. You know why? Because of the four big systems that, that we, we uh, with help here and, and our partners. And then we had a board retreat uh, in early June, and then we've culminated into a process for learn for next three to five years. So we are just finishing that strategic planning process here, by virtue of which Learn is a very lean and mean organization. You know, I've led bigger ones. One of the one of the things I feel comfortable doing is to nurture an organization. I consider myself as a startup person, go in and grow things. How do you do that? Innovation. How do you uh, create growth? Value. So what, what we're going to see today is between us and the discussions, what we, we want to really uh, force things out of you is, what is that value? What is that thing that you're missing that you would want to do that we are not aware or others are not aware? And then we can cultivate that into ideas, themes, you know, groups or whatever it takes to, to create. Um, so, you know, one of the fascinating people I met in Houston was Denise, one of your researchers here. And, you know, as I came in, one thing was clear. Research as such over Learn Network is happening, but people are not getting together to talk about it. So we've noted that, Denise, right, as part of the strategic planning. The first thing uh, we did was along with that was the security was the second big one. So we come across those two. We're going to have some forums here and, and things that you would see come out of Learn. Some of you may not, but the ones who are actively involved in working groups and boards, uh, you need to also consult with them and talk. And I'll leave you with some contact information. So uh, let's go and see what the Learn community is today, right? You have, uh, I have a large board. 39 people on the board, that's the, uh, uh, you know, a tough challenge, but that's the whole idea. This, the community comes together uh, in, in, in organizations like LEARN. So we have 30 uh, public universities and systems, uh, five privates, uh, community colleges are coming to us as affiliates, as one, one whole group. Um, and then the school districts, you know, our, our networks are now beyond higher ed. Right? And so another question, I'm, I'm going to go uh, dance around a few questions that have come to me over 20 years. So a higher education network, pure research, pure education, Pankaj, now you're opening it up. You have governments and you have federal governments and some industry. What happens to us? Well, it's actually a good problem because the way networks are designed, we have to design them horizontally so that at all times we can give you that bandwidth that every student needs here and, and is looking for now. Every classroom instruction instructor needs, every uh, you know academic uh, administrator needs. But at the same time, we have to design this for the Denise's of the world, and I'll use her name you know a lot today, to make sure that you have those peaks in the network. These varied organizations force us to remain very vigilant, very agile, so that we build the networks of the future, not the one that you need today. So with, with all this, what we do is, uh, you know, we have this implicit rule in our mind that at any given point, r &E has preference over everything that we do. So we will make sure that our traffic, our bandwidth, our size of the pipes are, are good enough for you to, to be always using uh, and not have issues. So again, I collected this thanks to a lot of the LEARN staff who's been there since inception. Uh, here are the affiliated members that come behind the University of Houston system. Uh, and, and if you look at it, the second piece, it gets a little bit complex. The way you do programmatically is one way. The way you connect is another way. So uh, under the SECP umbrella, which is the US, you can now pieces of the Internet to uh, organization, these organizations come under and connect back into the, uh, into the backbone. So uh, specific to, to UH, this is how much I've found, and I would love to double this slide up at the end of today's conversation because I'm sure we miss things. I'm doing research and trying to find what have we done so far together. So uh, uh, you know, some of the, the traffic that you're having, the SZG is uh, Southeast Texas Gigapop. Uh, in fact, I'm meeting with them later this evening. 
Um, so we, we work with them very closely, connect back to the networks. Your traffic goes both way into SetG as well as to learn depending on, on what bits and bytes. You don't need to know that. We make sure that that happens in the background and it happens both in Houston and Dallas. Um, so some of the other projects uh, is, is Genie project. And again, uh, Dr. Denise is, is working on it. She was good enough to actually call for a workshop over here on SDN software-defined networks uh, uh, last year. Uh, and then uh, from perspective of uh, uh, supporting LEARN, indeed, when LEARN came together 10 or 11 years ago with these patches of fiber in the Houston area, we, we have IRUs or what we call as contracts in the, in the fiber industry with all of you to build that patches into Houston so we could connect our network into Austin, Houston, Dallas, and College Station. So this has been an extremely powerful relationship with UH, where you are providing certain air gaps, as we call in our industry, where we can fill in that metro area without having to spend a lot of dollars. Because at the end of the day, we are a collaboration, and every penny that comes in and out belongs to you. So as we work together, we reduce the cost. Uh, we've also worked with you to create your disaster recovery situation. At one point, we used to back up a lot of your data into Dallas. And I think I, what I understand from my CTO, we are now doing that uh, out in Victoria for you. And so we extended our network and our routing uh, pay. Uh, this was an interesting ask. I asked uh, Akbar and I said, so imagine 6% of, of the entire Texas is traffic that goes and comes out of internet too. And now this is a dynamic scale. This is 11 month of data that I could get my hands on. 6% of it is UH, right? Now, you want to grow it, right? It should be much more. And we want this pie to be bigger. So that's our goal, right? We will make sure you're never thirsty. You'll have enough capacity to go around and, and get your work done. Um, so a fantastic experiment, right? Coming out of NSF, right? Kevin Thompson is, is very dear and, and has been very cooperative, very good to our community. And, and uh, you know, when I look at this map, I'm, I'm very proud. Texas has eight recipients of this award and you're one of them, right? Uh, my goal at some point, uh, Denise, I'm gonna look at you again, uh, as we establish this, is to bring all of these players together. You know, if you're willing to do that, I'm willing to come down here and I want to learn a lot from them and see what we can do beyond this experiment. Uh, in this case, uh, each of the campuses uh, was given a grant and, and learn kind of help patch this because you have traffic going on. And you've established some flavor of a science DMZ on your campus so that your research traffic can be treated slightly differently or how differently than your regular traffic so you can do much high data intensive, big data kind of experiments on every campus, right? And I'm still getting my hands on it. I have not read through and understood all of the architectures, but when I look at the, the opportunities we have to work together uh, with the three drains we have for internet to a new drain that we are just about to, to establish, the board agreed to connecting to ESnet because of the traffic between TAC and, and, and uh, the West Coast and so on. So uh, another placeholder for you as to how important this is for you as UH to be part of this. And I think this can grow into some, some very nice experiments of the future and architectures. Uh, so I'll take you a little bit outside of UH now and the data that I've been able to collect and has enchanted me. Here are some experiments. Uh, uh, University of Texas Arlington has about 20 gig connection into us. And mainly their biggest experiment is connecting back to the uh, Large Hadron Collider. So there is a big stream of data coming in uh, on the Large Hadron Collider. And then that leads to two or three different experiments that are happening at any given point. Again, the reason why we need to, our networks have to be designed for those peaks and we just can't flatten out and, and say, you know, traffic as usual. Um, I'm gonna skip this one for last because it's an interesting placeholder for these two experiments, but it adds into, into more data later. So, uh, Baylor College of Medicine, 
uh, my employers as such, somebody asked me, I'm a learn employee, but you know, it's a small organization, so we have fiscal responsibilities. So I have an ID in my bag here, which says Baylor College of Medicine, right? I've been there only twice, maybe tomorrow. Um, but the, the power of this, this is about, um, my understanding is at any given point, uh, about 90 gig of data goes in and out of, of the repository that the genomics data has it. So the 50 terabytes is the youth storage. Think about how much of data is going in and out at any given point across. And, and this data definitely goes through Learn, Internet2, and some other networks, allied networks here. Uh, so, so then comes, again, as to how experiments and science, and you know, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, converted into a network engineer as I did my master's at Brooklyn College. That's how I came to this country in 86. I still have a letter from Siemens uh, where I worked for in Mumbai saying, hey, when you come back, we'll offer you a job. I needed that to go to the US consulate to get my visa to come to US in 1986, right? So I get around saying, I still have that letter someday, I can use it if I go back. My point is the world is so flat and the amount of information that goes through our networks, we, didn't, we don't even know. We think we do. And, and, and there's so much good there, right? We have these assaults on us and denial of service attacks and sleepless nights and it's not a question of whether but when. All of that is true, but the world has been transformed because of experiments such as these, you know, the three or four that I'm gonna to mention to you. And um, I think the creative juices, and for even a person like me who, who's not a scientist per se, but I deal with all of you, and I'm not even a researcher per se. I mean, I've done work with NSF, got grants, have a patent file, and things like that. But the, the breadth of and, and the enormity of what has happened on our networks every day when I read is just mind-boggling and very positive. So. SMU is experimenting on measuring top quarks. I didn't know what quarks were till I started reading. And, and based on that, the LHC, so a lot of this goes back to the Large Hadron Collider. Again, this is the second uh, university now, right? Besides, I mentioned UT Arlington and then TAC, of course. Uh, so they're transforming our daily lives. When I was reading through the details of what was going on in this research, molecular medicine, energy research, advanced manufacturing, and data management and cancer research through something that you would have never thought is done because of what we are studying in terms of space and, and, and the particle physics and the analysis as to how uh, these particles play a role in our lives, right? So all of this is happening on, on LEARN's backbone and some of it in a net too and going into, into LHC. Um, another example is, uh, is uh, Texas A&M and University of Haifa. You know, I, not lived on the coast for a while, I know of how many accidents with oil leaks and, and things that we've done through, gone through in so many years. Uh, again, when I started reading and understanding the depth of, of where this was, um, this is uh, uh, University of Haifa working with uh, uh, you know, TN, uh, Texas A&M here, uh, close to us, and basically the faculty and student exchange program. So it's not just collecting data and scientifically absorbing it, and of course providing all of this. I'm sure the petroleum industry, I'm sure, uh, you know, Department of Environment, uh, everybody's using this data from what I gather. You know, it's. It's, it's a place where they have grown so much, they are looking at, can we now store at the supercomputer center at this point? Um, but the, the real-time data modeling, now that was only possible because once they connected to each other, they used to send, and they still send delegations to each other, there are still students going back and forth, but now they are doing real-time collaboration, right? I'd love to see the tools they are using, I don't know that but it just opens up another avenue for us between LEARN and, and the universities to look at how far uh, this kind of collaborations can go. Um, and this is near and dear to my heart, 
the K-12 piece, right? We all talk about this, but as I'm learning the Houston area, as I meet with your, you know, the K-12 community here as well, it's the number of students. I was just, you know, I mind-boggling when I saw that Houston area, you're talking at two million plus K-12 students who are gonna be either using, or are already using, or want to use our backbone. There's a pent up demand, right? So, so um, the, the benefits that have come from, from, uh, from such partnership, all of these things that we learn here from you, you know, nice name, learn, right? I get that. And I learn every day. Everything that we do, when we go and talk to the students, when we talk to the administrators and, 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 and teachers, and I've done this in Ohio as well, it was interesting, yesterday at dinner I found out that Lisa's husband and I worked in offices next to each other for 10 years, 12. Didn't know until I saw the last name. That's the kind of work Ohio Link and, and Ornet and OSC has also been doing in Ohio, right? So what you are seeing here and, and the examples are similarly repeated in different spaces around all of our 50 states. Uh, but what this does is it brings all of the learnings that we have and all of the high-end research and, and practices into suddenly into the K-12 realm. So Internet 2's K-20 advisory group uh, working with at the national level, bringing museums, libraries, long, long ago, right? And Doyle and I have worked since 2000. All of those phenomenal things that we started as community and now you can see some of the results that are happening. It's very difficult for an outsider to connect the dots, but if you've seen the evolution, you can see that things that we thought may be helpful, let's create this working group, suddenly has led into a huge program and something, for example, a lot of these programs came together under BTOP, the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program that happened in 2008, nine and a lot of states, including Texas, got millions of dollars for creating networks in rural and unserved areas, and, and it happened. School districts and libraries were one of the biggest beneficiaries besides higher education, uh, community colleges, and others. So um, when I look at just the savings and, and part of, um, I would call it technology culture that's being uh, imported from the higher education into, into K-12, it is enormous, right? Um, let me give you another example, pulmonary fibrosis. Now, this comes very close to me, touches me. I was just mentioning somebody, um, um, a close family of member of mine is suffering from this. And he was with me till yesterday for two months because I had to take care of him while my sister was away. And when I looked at this research, and I looked at that, you know, uh, the, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation is kind of hungry to get this data together. And what this research is doing, bringing all of the patient care data, normalizing it, and then spreading it around to create new medicines. I can tell you this, had that medicine been there three years ago, that close family members of mine would not be in, in critical situation that he is today, right? So things like this, using our networks, getting this data fast out there, doing real-time analysis, creating new drugs, you know, is, is all part of what is happening on our backbone without us, us really looking at or, or feeling. So I had held that previous slide uh, because again, this topic kind of hits home. Um, in Ohio, when I resigned there last uh, uh, fall, uh, I had both uh, for last four years, two portfolios, the network and the supercomputers. And so somebody can say, you left all that and, and what happened? Well, it was 10 years of great work there, right? But what's happening in Texas with TAC, which is actually one of the largest uh, computers in the world, and Dan Stenzion and I have professionally known each other, uh, is, is wonderful work. Uh, the Lone Star 5, which is actually helping out these five systems and the rest of you too. I'm sure, you know, Denise, other researchers, you have had accounts on the National Supercomputer Centers. 
but really the work that's going on at TAC and the amount of infusion, I had a privilege of visiting them at the end of Supercomputing 15 last year in Austin. Uh, I, it, it's, it's incredible amount of data research and work that's going on that all of us can benefit. And uh, we are having consistent flows from, from TAC, flow of data, that we are taking between here, the West Coast, and some into LHC and internet too. So we are actually in the process of growing a connection uh, that would help us right here in Houston uh, and make the pipes bigger so that these players who have invested directly and all of you would benefit from the uh, work that's going on on both coasts. Um, so I guess, you know, I just have flooded you with all the examples and I will keep this, you know, I can keep the map up here a little bit because that's what is important in terms of what happens when we, uh, you know, bring in a, uh, a network such as Learn and or, uh, um, sorry, I'll go to the first slide. In a net two together, but any questions that come to your mind in terms of examples that I shot at? How many of you knew about some of this, let's say 50% of what you saw today? How many of you? One hand, my favorite researcher in Texas. <laughs> right? So, so we can talk. You know, I can give you examples out of examples out of examples, but I gave you a few that touched me by looking at what happens. And if, if it touched me, I'm sure there's lots going on, right? In, in uh, Ohio, uh, one of my favorite examples was uh, Children's Hospital, which is now called the Nationwide Children's in Columbus. Uh, I'm talking about 2005, six. Uh, we were still at uh, one gig backbone. That was what is 100 gig today. Uh, it had just come in. Um, and uh, there are kids in Southeast Ohio, uh, very, very, you know, families that are extremely under the poverty line. And this was true. I visited the hospital in Southeast Ohio and then I visited Children's Hospital to get the understanding how can we have network between them. We gave them a 45 meg pipe, what, was, what used to be called DS3. They used to have T1s, what are called fractional T1s, like 1.5 megs. So we brought them a DS3 as an experiment. Cost us a lot of money, but we picked up a grant and some of our monies. And examples after examples in three months, I was called by the center director at, at, and, and he had screens set up there to show me saying, you have no idea, but the work that all of you did here, along with Ornet and the rest of the universities, is incredible. So there is this person, there's this baby sitting in an incubator who was transported that morning, right? Now, normally speaking, mom would come with them. This is a three-month-old baby. And or mom just could not come because there was no money. They, they, she could not do anything but stay there until the hospital called and said, take the baby back. The transport cost them $7,000, roughly. Right, the whole thing. And then the nurturing and the caring and taking care while the mom and parents are completely cut off. With the technology that we had given them, they had live video conferencing back and forth. And the mom was sitting there and she could touch the incubator on the screen. She had tears in her eyes and so, so did the doctors. All of those examples when you see live, it gives you goosebumps as to how we don't know, but we can transform things using networks such as ours and technologies that we are going to create together. Right? So, uh, lots of examples, lots. Ten twenty-eight. I've stayed on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, architecture that works sometimes. Yes. Okay, if there are no questions, I think we can have a, a dialogue here, and thank you again for inviting us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.